It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 135, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Ruth Chantry raises a little under four acres of vegetables, plus eggs, pork, and beef with her husband, Everett Lundquist, at Common Good Farm, just a little ways outside of Lincoln, Nebraska. With sales to their 65-member CSA, farmer's markets, and wholesale accounts, Ruth and Everett make a full-time living on 20 acres of ground. Common Good Farm is certified organic and certified biodynamic, and Ruth spells out the practical implications of biodynamic farming at Common Good Farm, how it fits into their marketing, and how she and Everett make the biodynamic farming prescriptions work for them. We also discuss the practical steps that Common Good Farm has taken to integrate their livestock into their vegetable operation in order to control weeds and insect pests, as well as the challenges of operating vegetables and livestock, both as significant parts of the farming operation. And we dig into the nuts and bolts of the egg operation from feed supplies to washing and delivering the eggs. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com And by Farmers Web, software for your farm. Farmers Web makes it easier to work with your buyers, saving time, reducing errors, and increasing your capacity to work with more buyers overall. FarmersWeb.com And by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. Ruth Chantry, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thank you. So I'd like to start off today by having you tell us a little bit about Common Good Farm there in Raymond, Nebraska. I mean, first of all, I'm willing to bet that most people aren't that familiar with Nebraska and and maybe you could situate us geographically and then tell us about how big your farm is and what kind of crops you're farming and how you're getting those to market. Um, we Well, Nebraska is north of Kansas, uh, west of Iowa, south of South Dakota, and east of Colorado, kind of right in the heart of the, I don't know, deep Great Plains. Um, I'm from here originally, and um, Everett's from Minnesota, so I was already kind of in process here, I guess, um, and but not from a farming background at all, uh, and neither is Everett. This is our 21st season here. Um, we had a couple other seasons in um, community farm in Wisconsin, uh, Philadelphia Community Farm, which was a great place to get your feet wet, I guess. And um, Everett had farmed some other places before that, even because he's from the Twin Cities. We're certified organic and certified biodynamic. Uh, we have pretty diversified on tw- 20 acres. We were um farming 36, but we lost 16 acres of pasture um, in a sale. I mean, we were renting it. Um, great rehabbed um, plantings that Everett had really worked on. So we were sad to see that go. But anyway, uh, we do CSA um, varies in size, a summer share, and then we have a separate fall share. Uh, pasture pork and grass-fed beef, both of those are certified organic also. And a plant sale in the spring with mostly focusing on vegetable starts, but some flowers and um, herbs, medicinals also. A little bit of season extension, but not a lot. Um, I joke I'm more interested in season contraction at this point. But um, and and we also have about, I think right now, about 850 laying hands of various ages. How many acres of vegetables and herbs are you farming? Um, I say four. Everett says less than four. Um, <laughs> I probably more like three and a half. It's pretty intensively. I mean, it's always maybe I bump it to four me- mentally because it's so intensive. Um, our spacing's pretty tight. Um, you know, crops two, sometimes three times in a bed in a season. Um, so in that regard, yeah, cause sometimes when I look at the spacing on somebody that might do five acres and then I look at how far apart things are, I'm like, yeah, but, but <laughs> what does that mean? So a lot of handwork, I mean, tractor work also for bed prep and stuff, but, uh, a lot of handwork in the field and then the rest is grazed or like, uh, we have two sows and a boar now. So they're moved around about once a month to like about like the old veg area postseason or in a real weedy area. And then same, we have six um, portable chicken houses. 
that are like on trailer uh, mobile home frames, like actual houses, and they get moved every week or two-ish, depending on the time of the year. Less in the winter, you know, if the wheels are frozen into the ground or something. But um, Are you guys making a living on the farm? Yep. It's 100% our livelihood at this point. One of the things that interested me about your operation is that you're a biodynamic farm. In fact, you're certified as a biodynamic farm. Right. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that means? Certified biodynamics uh, kind of predates the organic movement, really. Um, Looking at, uh, well, for us, creating a whole farm organism, that's kind of a crucial point for all biodynamics. So in that creating... um, uh, soil fertility within the farm. So most biodynamic farms, if not all, would have animals um, as a key component. Um, that's a large part of, you know, trying to, not trying to bring that in, but trying to have that part of the circle that's here. And then also all sorts of, you know, people tend to leap towards the biodynamic preps are commonly kind of, you know, kind of all the weirdest parts of it are given as examples um, that people quickly jump to. But a lot of it is kind of old knowledge that is really being reused again. People come to it for different reasons we have found over the years. Um, For us, we had a lot of the, I guess, the philosophical parts were um, palatable to us and we went with that. There's a lot of people that use biodynamics that just know it works. For us, biodynamics is on a practical, you know, kind of daily level. It's the background for most of the decisions that are made as far as, like I said, the animals that are here, problem solving, soil soil fertility decisions. Um, we make all our own potting mix. So that's from the um, cattle, the compost that's created here on farm. From, then that's sifted here and we make our own potting mix for all our own starts as well as our, for our plant sale in the spring. So pretty intensive process in that regard, I feel like for the scale of how many plants go out of here. Um, But also that's um, part of, we feel like the quality we'd like to think and have seen evidence of it, like the keeping quality of the food, um, the taste, Uh, obviously, or not, I shouldn't say obviously, but a lot of farms that are biodynamic and especially wineries, I guess that um, it's really become much more kind of in the news in the last, I'd say, decade because of, say, the sugars and the quality of grapes. So a lot of wineries, that's really where a lot of attention has been paid to it in more recent years. But yeah, for the folks that aren't familiar with biodynamics at all, it uh, predates the organic movement in the like in 19 what 24 um, Rudolf Steiner gave lectures in Germany uh, what Austria what is now Germany where farmers were already starting to see a decline in like how long a stand of alfalfa would last in a field and um, the health of some of their animals and so they're already starting to see a decline in the soil and the quality of the soil and so um, some of the this is the lectures that were given and the thoughts towards all that problem solving was in response to um, those inquiries of already seeing the declines. Uh, Apparently alfalfa used to stand in a field with high quality for, you know, maybe a couple decades. And now we've gone towards over all these, you know, many decades to what now, maybe two, three years. So that's kind of how it started. To me, biodynamics has always looked like a whole lot of work. (laughs) Uh, How how many people do you guys have working on the farm there? Mostly just us. Um, We have, sometimes we have an intern. This year we have a pretty part-time intern. Um, I would kind of just pick up people here and there. We'll have for our CSA, uh, usually once a month, like a field day work time. And we might have one person, we might have eight just depends for a few hours. So that's always great. And that's just for, you know, community and fun. And also then um, we also tend to get um, like this year, just some folks that might want to come and volunteer for a couple of days. So it's just a real kind of a cobbled together <laughs> effect, but we're, you know, for like harvest days, we're wanting to be able to count on our, just ourselves, I guess. Um, I don't want to be, I guess, in the position of, you know, somebody's out, and then we can't get it done, things like that. So, and the biodynamics doesn't happen, you know, all day, every day. That is, um, there's m- moments and planning and certain tasks that need to be done, but that's not like it's changing what we're doing every day and we don't have to harvest differently or something like that. You know, it's sprays that happen certain times of the year. The compost preparations would go in a certain time. 
I mean, it's just an attentiveness that would happen differently at other times. It can change when I might, we might plant something um, if we're really adhering to the biodynamic calendar, which just talks about some um, not looking at moon. A lot of people, you know, old, older wisdom of just looking at moon phases and things like that, but it's looking at some other planetary influences also. Um, and there's a couple options for calendars that are spelled out. And so like a big cheat sheet. Um, and if we can, we go by some of that. And if we're just under the gun, um, we'll just do what we need to do and put that aside. It's something I always, I, I've thought about in, in this time of climate change is, is, you know, that, that challenge of trying to follow something like a biodynamic calendar, because, you know, so often now you just have to plant when you can plant because it's the only right. chance you're going to get. Right. And that's happened plenty. You know, if it's been rainy and we have 10 minutes where it's dry enough to work around, that's even if it's like not favorable um, on the, you know, biodynamic calendar, it's going to happen anyway. Um, and, you know, in theory, there's things that can be suggested to like rework that ground or hoe at a more favorable time to get the influences in there, you know, that it might be more favorable. But yeah, I mean, the reality is in the greenhouses when I pay the most attention to that and or if we're doing a big seeding out in the field, maybe for squash or something. But um, we're so under under. Yeah. All the climate, you know, rain, dry, heat, whatever, just time. You have to just get it done is the reality. So, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's Everett's really the spearhead. Um behind all that i mean we came we met actually kind of through the, the umbrella of biodynamics and our interest in that and waldorf school we, there's a waldorf preschool at the time that we both were involved in and i had more interest in kind of the homemaking and some of the other rhythmic stuff to the side and then his big interest was in biodynamics and some farms that he had visited while he was still in college what like i don't know if you've ever heard of ruth Sinecker. um she was over by Madison, Wisconsin, and he had visited her farm. And that was the oldest biodynamic farm in the United States. Um, and he was just so impressed by what he saw there and what it felt like there and her and she had her presence um, that really made sense. It all put it together for him and kind of he went from there. Have you found that the biodynamics is an advantage to you marketing in Lincoln, Nebraska? Probably not. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's important to us since we are certified, um, you know, it's something that we can talk about. I mean, it gives us opportunity to share what it's about. You know, if we weren't certified, then I mean, we'd say we're doing it, but it wouldn't be, you know, this jumping off point. Um, there are definitely people that are interested in it also. And um, I guess with the, you know, obviously with so much information available and so accessible to people everywhere. Um, Folks are much more uh, savvy about it or have, ha you know, read a lot on their own um, where that wasn't the case 20 years ago. You know, people were just really it wasn't it was quite, quite foreign. Um, so it's something we do because we think it's important and we want to do it in that regard. That's, you know, it might be a step above or to us, but it's not necessarily like a big, we're not doing it necessarily because it's a selling point as far as, you know, it's going to put us above and beyond. It's there and it's, um, well, we, it's there <laughs> and we think it's important, it, we're, but we're doing it because we think it's important, not because, you know, for market gain or anything. More of an internal motivation rather than an external motivation. And um, I mean, once in a while I'll say, you know, there's only, there are two two certified biodynamic farms in Nebraska. And so some, once in a while, you know, promote that, that like, and, or that you can't get certified biodynamic and certified organic plant starts, you know, that's like a handful of, if maybe four or five farms in the United States do plant sales like we do that have certified biodynamic plants available. So, you know, once in a while I'm like, I think that's cool. It's like, it's here. Like, you know, if you want it, it's here. So what is the the market for fresh local and organic food like in Lincoln, Nebraska? Um, I think it's uh, I think it's a very active community um, in many regards. Definitely local local support of any you know any local business is really uh, important to the community. 
Um, there's, I can't remember how many farmers, there's one food co-op that we sell uh, quite a lot to and have a good relationship with. Um, there's several different avenues for selling like kind of wholesale type that have started in the last couple of years to bigger groceries, but we had also done that on our own. Um, and they, that kind of middleman um, buying group has developed relationships with some restaurants. Uh, we haven't worked with them as much, but, um, and there's probably one, two, five farmers markets, a couple larger ones um, that are on the weekends and then a few smaller, you know, midweek markets. Um, so I think it's, um, I think it's interesting the pricing, um, like say Lincoln to Omaha, for example, or what I hear somebody, you know, it's kind of the apples and oranges, like people compare, you know, they might want to know like how strong a market is, how much can you make and things like that. Or, or CSA, you know, it's just so hard to compare one. They're just so vastly different all the time. Um, when people get into comparisons as an aside, but, um, anyway, I think it's a strong, a strong, a strong community on the east side of Nebraska. Um, and I think it's gaining also in kind of central Nebraska, Grand Island, Hastings area. There's more small farms or um, like they might be doing mostly eggs, selling to a couple uh, local grocery stores in their community. So I think that's great because it's kind of been there was I think there's a little bit of lag time from when folks used to grow mostly their own large gardens, things like that. Um, and then I felt like there's a gap where that was ending just because of work situations, um, generations, whatever. Um, and that had stopped and, or, you know, slowed down. There's a little bit of gap before this kind of boom towards, you know, this is still important to support whether someone's not growing their own, maybe in their backyard, but we still want to have it in our state or community. And how can we make that happen? Or how can we support that? Even if it's not my own efforts in my backyard, that sort of thing. So I, I'm seeing a little bit of a wave of that across the state, not just the Eastern more populated part. So that's really good. And when you guys started there in the Lincoln neighborhood 21 years ago, what was the market like at that point? Were you guys really bringing this idea of, of local and organic produce to the community or was that something that was already there? Um, I think, yeah, that predates the internet, remember? So <laughs> it was really a different, uh, completely different thing. I mean, it's just, yeah, I, I can't even express how different it was. It's changed so quickly, obviously, but because um, when we would promote our CSA, you know, we'd have to have an event. I mean, it was dog and flyers around to the coffee shops, which we still might do. But um, uh, the only way we could get it, you know, in a paper more, you know, you had to type up a press release and send it in or have an event um, like we would get have a room at the library just to talk about CSA in general, open it to the public, invite a reporter um, just so people would know we we're here. Um, so uh, I think organics then was still suspect, I guess I would say CSA was completely com fairly really quite foreign here still and forget biodynamics. I mean, people's eyes would just glaze over. So it's like, we partly, we, you know, how many weirdnesses can you choose to promote? <laughs> and so we would kind of just leave biodynamics a little bit, you know, if someone was inquiring, inquiring, that's why it's, it hasn't always been in the forefront. Not that we were um, putting it aside so much, you know, like it hidden, it was just more like, okay, what's, what's the most approachable for people? Um, but there was definitely a strong farmer's market um, in Lincoln. Then it's probably, I don't know if it's tripled in size then. And then all these other smaller markets have started. There had been one or two CSAs that had one had had one year and come and gone. And then another had had a few years and was gone pretty quickly. So yeah, that, the concept of CSA has been very slow in Nebraska um, to get started compared to, you know, the upper Midwest or um, even Iowa where there's like practical farmers really got behind it and promoted it. Um, so that's still, there's not a huge, large number of CSAs in Nebraska by any means. Um, and it's probably, it's, a, you know, it's a big state and a small population really spread out. So, um, yeah, it's just that the climate of information has changed so much and availability. Um, so that's all helped. That's all been really good for everyone. And you guys do most of your marketing there in Lincoln, right? You're not, you're not heading up to Omaha. 
Uh, yeah, mostly, I mean, because we can do it mostly in Lincoln. We used to take CSA shares up to Omaha our first few years. Um, I think gas was like 87 cents a gallon then. <laughs> and we had more time. I mean, it was just, we used to talk about, did we have less time or less, less no time or less no money? And um, which one was more approachable to, you know, so, and then we do like I talked about this Lone Tree Foods um, that we've worked with some, they have some restaurants in Omaha that they deliver to. And um, that I think, you know, we've sold some that way where we're not having to actually take it up there ourselves because we just don't have time at this point. So, so that's been great. But yeah, by and large, things go to Lincoln um, and we'll have once in a while CSA folks that come from somewhere else. Um, but it's just handy. It's right there. So about 25 minutes away for us. Tell me some more about your farming operation. I mean, we talked about a little bit about the biodynamic aspects of it, but how are you guys getting the work done on a daily basis? You mentioned that you're kind of using a combination of tractor implements and, and hand tools to, to do the work. It depends on the task, but yeah, if we have a, an old Ford that, um, it's got a hydrostat. So we have a spader. He doesn't use a spader that much. Um, just if he, if we were breaking up new ground, he used it a lot when we first came here um, because this had been CRP ground. And so um, it had never had really, I don't think it ever, it's we're high up um, on purpose. So we didn't get drainage high up for Nebraska. I mean, it's not like <laughs> not high up for some people, but um, there's, you know, a significant slope in some places uh so but there's enough flat and uh, some gradated you know some pretty slight slopes that there's enough for veg anyway um so we have a rototiller like a tractor mounted rototiller the spader like i said gets used rarely um we have a walk behind rototiller uh that we use some not as i kind of forget that it's there we use it some if we need to that's all we used to use before we had the tractor mounted one that obviously it transformed everything because we were walk behinding the whole field I'm trying to think what else just a lot of hand hose like the little hand hose if i have especially like a field day you know it's nice for people to get in there that are not as familiar with this whatever kind of other cultivating tool um and they're great actually you know if you for if people want to have a conversation or something and they're just you know i'm not gonna really it's not like you're gonna really demand a lot of someone that's volunteering two hours of their time for you or there's a farm. We have a potato digger uh, and then we grind all of, well, ever grinds all our own chicken feed on the farm and, and hog feed. So um, a grinder mixer and we did get a skid loader uh, not quite two years ago, which was awesome. That's, <laughs> that's like a fantastic thing to have. So, yeah. Is the is the skid steer something that you're using in the vegetable operation, or is that primarily a, a materials handling thing for the for the livestock? Um, not yeah, not so much in vegetables. Although um, I'd gotten pretty behind on picking zucchini, and um, we'd had a, quite a bit of rain, so just we went through, and all the ones usually we're on it, but we're having an incredible cucurbit year so far. We there's like no, I don't know. I think it's the Midwest. There's just not cucumber beetles like usual. I don't know where they are, but it's great not to, not to have clouds of them like usual. Um, and yeah, so like that, we used it to pick up a bunch of way too big zucchini and give them to the cattle or the pigs or, you know, stuff like that. But no, mostly it's um, for turning compost. Um and things like that, you know, hey, can we use it for giving hay? I think we have used it for moving flats of plants around a little bit. It's another option for things like that. You know, farming in Nebraska, I mean, you know, obviously it's an agricultural state, but it's not a place that, that at least in my mind, where I go to vegetables. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you face raising vegetables in that climate? Probably, I don't know. It feels like everything. Um, we, I mean, maybe people say this everywhere. Probably they do, but we've some friends of ours that are produce and they also have goat dairy. Um, we talk about if you can grow vegetables here, you really can grow vegetables anywhere. And I don't know if that's true, but it feels like it. Um, uh, we do have a lot of cucumber beetles. I mean, with all the corn around, I mean, I feel like that's part of the life cycle of, you know, since they're the corn, whatever worm, right? Is there a larva? 
So I feel like that's probably in Iowa too, but that's going to just be here. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Uh, the soils can be very, it, I mean, there's a huge range of soil types in Nebraska overall. And, you know, we have several soil types just in our own place, but, um, you know, some pretty heavy soils. Um, our soil is, I love our soil now, but here, when we first got here, it was just really painful to work in. I mean, just real sharp and cloddy, even no matter what time of year you worked, it wasn't because you were working at the wrong time of year. It was, or too wet. And you had, we had to be incredibly careful when we worked it, because if you did it with the slightest bit of moisture in there, you were kind of, that was it for, you know, that was it (laughs) for the whole season. Um, So drift now is going to become more and more, I mean, each each month passing, I think, for doing organic veg or any veg, any specialty crop. That's not just organic versus conventional. That's what everybody that's doing any specialty crop or sensitive crop um, is going to be facing. Um, I'm trying to think what else. The weather can be incredibly diverse. Uh, it can be really hot and humid, you know, uh, rains generally until this year, I would say the last I don't know, decade maybe. Generally, I count on no rain from about June 10th to maybe August, mid-August or so. We'll catch, we might catch one in there. So you guys have to be really focused on irrigation with that kind of a rainfall pattern. Um, well, sort of. I mean, we kind of push it a little bit. Um, actually, we, um, we used to have a 24-week CSA. I mean, that's the part where it, sometimes it feels like how how clever can we be, I guess? Um, uh, so we, when we started, we had a 24 week CSA season and then we went to 22 because we were packing out the first couple years before we were on here, we are on, uh, some rented, a rented acre. Um, and we were packing out in snow a lot. We just didn't have great capabilities for that. And so, um, anyway, and then there was a previous drought, like a couple droughts ago. I don't know um, how long ago it was now, but we decided to switch it up and went to the shorter summer share. So like this year they can do 15 weeks, but there's some that can do a 12 week. Op- I mean, folks can do a 12 week option or bump it up to 15. And then we do a separate fall share, which is one time only um, of mostly storage veg. And people can do both or one or the other. And we went to that because it felt like we were irrigating so heavily when there's droughts and or you know exceedingly dry conditions if you have that for three years you start really wondering like what's what are we doing here like why are we um why are we putting so much water on just to get you know four more weeks of something um when maybe it's not appropriate so that was a bigger examination of um what the intent was and um so yeah that was a bigger examination of of, you know, how can we address what our particular climate was? Um, even our, you know, kind of neighborhood climate, there was a lake, uh, a, a man-made lake about, I don't know, five miles west of us. And back during that time, there were so many times where we'd see storms headed our way when we were just absolutely desperate for rain. And they'd split at that lake and they, you know, go about three miles then east of us and you could see the storm come back together and that had just happened so many times we really are like what's like what's happening right here and then you know talking to old guys in the neighborhood they're like oh yeah i could have told you it always does that like well that would have been nice and nice to know before i bought this but um yeah and so uh that really took some pressure off it's kind of a felt like uh we were making ourselves not less than, but we're so used to like CSA has to be this many weeks, you know, that makes it the real deal. Um, and, um, but it's worked really well. We have a lot of CSA members that are, um, have their own gardens anyway, or want to have at least a little bit of something. And so it works great in that we are, you know, at 15 or 16 weeks, even we're, um, winding down, um, when they have like plenty of tomatoes and basil on their own side, or maybe they have a cucumber um, because they want to do that anyway. And so it works really well in that regard. And then too, with the separate fall share, that's one time only we can get people that um, aren't going to drive here every week. Um, But they are happy to come one time and have that, 
have that relationship with the farm and want the veg that way. And it works out for them to come, you know, maybe even two hours, but there's certainly, it wouldn't work for them to do that all the time. That's a really great adaptation. I like that. (laughs) Thank you. What are you guys doing for irrigation water? Is that coming out of a well? Um, yeah. And we just have a well, one well for the house and the farm. So, um, if we had, maybe if we had a field well, we would feel more comfortable pushing it. Um, you know, but I don't want to compromise, you know, our great water for the house and our family in addition to, or the animals just, yeah. So yeah, one well for everything. And when we used to have borrowed or this rented land, some other pasture, um, that was, that really helped us a few years um, because our herd would be over at this rented pasture when water was really tight. And so um, sometimes we leave them there a little bit longer just because that was however many gallons a day where our herd was over there having that water instead. Um, So all those things you just have to start looking at when anybody that's been in a drought knows that you start looking at things a little bit differently. Yeah. I didn't think about the fact that the, the livestock, of course, take a significant amount of water in addition to what the vegetables need. Right. Especially cattle. I mean, chickens, even that adds up, but, um, cause, uh, and the pigs, not, you know, not a huge amount, but the cattle, I can't remember how many gallons a day a cow, a cat had a cattle drinks. It's pretty significant actually. So yeah. Um, and so if you have, you know, a herd of any size, like 20 or 25 head, then that's significant. All right. I think this is a good place for us to take a quick break, grab a word from a couple of sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Ruth Chantry of Common Good Farm. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are often mistaken for just a rototiller, but they are truly a superior piece of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy where small farms are a way of life, BCS tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment. Exactly what it is and exactly the kind of dependability that every farm needs. I've been so lucky to work with BCS tractors for over 24 years, and I wouldn't consider anything else for my small tractor needs. And I am not the only fan. More than 1.5 million people in 50 countries have discovered the advantages of owning Europe's most popular two-wheel tractor. And these really are small tractors with the kinds of features found on their four-wheel cousins and a wide variety of equipment. Power harrows, rotary plows, flail mowers, snow throwers, sickle bar mowers, chippers, log splitters, and more. Check out bcsamerica.com to see photos and videos of BCS in action. bcsamerica.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is also brought to you by Farmer's Web, software for your farm. Farmer's Web makes it easy to work with your buyers, saving you time, increasing efficiency, reducing mistakes, and streamlining order management. Who doesn't need that? Farmer's Web helps you manage orders from buyers who place them online, but also those that order by phone or by email. Use Farmer's Web to generate a product catalog for your buyers, to allow buyers to view your real-time availability online, and to create harvest lists and packing slips for your orders. Farmer's Web helps you inform your buyers of delivery routes, pickup locations, lead times, and more, all while helping you keep track of special pricing and customer information. You can also download detailed financial reports. Farmer's Web offers a free account type and a flat monthly fee on paid plans. You can pause, cancel, or switch plans at any time. Check out a demo video and the Farmer's Web guide to working with wholesale buyers at farmersweb.com. All right, and we're back with Ruth Chantry of Common Good Farm in Raymond, Nebraska. Do you guys integrate the livestock into the vegetable operation? I mean, is it, are, are those, I mean, obviously, you know, if you've got uh, four acres of vegetables and herbs on a 34 acre farm, you're, you're doing a lot more with the, with the livestock than just using them with the vegetables. But do you bring the pigs and the chickens and the cows into the vegetable ground? Um, after, yeah, post season, I mean, obviously not during, but so, you know, after frost, when something's completely done, um, it's a great way for, you know, chickens can go in and clean up, um, all the, you know, sweet seeds and slop tomatoes that maybe got dropped or, um, even, you know, bug larva, um, cattle, not so much. Um, we have 
more if he if there's a fallow area or where he planted it, if ever put a cover crop in on an uh you know a half acre or something he might put the cattle in there but that's unusual um so uh, I'm trying to think of what else. Usually a rotation more with pigs and chickens, um, not necessarily in that order. Uh, pigs also, will, we can put them in somewhere that's, you know, it's done for the season and do a lot of cleanup in that regard. We actually started, we got the pigs originally because our bindweed problem was so bad. Um, so, you know, if carrots take 10 days to germinate, um, then we were getting, I don't know, are you familiar with bindweed? For anyone that knows what bindweed is, it's um, horrible. Um, I know there's folks that say any kind of grass, like Timothy grass or whatever, is much worse. And I guess in the years that we've had a lot of grass, um, I start feeling that way. But um, anyway, we originally got pigs because the bindweed problem was so bad. And so so old timers around here said, get a pig and put it on for three years. And we thought, well, we can't put pigs on for three years and just walk away from vegetables. Um, But we did do pigs intensively in some really problematic areas um, for a whole season and really um thought wow that's amazing the difference and but we also felt like we didn't have time to have pigs and so we thought we're gonna not have pigs and boy one year without pigs then we thought no we're we're gonna have pigs still (laughs) because they knocked back the bindweed um it's not gone by any means and it probably never will be because the seeds are um viable for i don't know 30 years or something or 50 and the roots go down 30 or 40 feet or something ridiculous like that. So, um, but it helped incredibly. So in response to that, we do put them, the pigs in certain areas um, more to an eye of, you know, if there's a weedier area, um, sometimes weed seeds are coming in with some of the um, chicken feed, you know, if they're, if it's in the oats or whatever. So sometimes we're introducing weed problems Um, in that regard. The chickens eat most of it, but sometimes they don't. Um, and, uh, it's really been huge help to have that kind of, that kind of help from, I guess, in working with the animals. Um, so, so were you, were you putting the animals and using them where it is good for them, where it works for the farm? Um, sometimes the spot that the animals go in are because it's hot and they need shade, um, particularly, so they might get moved kind of out of out of cycle of where they would go. Usually Um, we might put them into a shadier spot if we're going to have a heat wave. I'm really interested that your guys are actually grinding the feed yourselves. Are you guys sourcing the feed locally? Yes, we are getting the grains locally. Um, We feel really fortunate, actually something I kind of took for granted for quite a while. Uh, There's um, people don't necessarily think of Nebraska as having a lot of organic grain ground, um, but there are quite a lot of organic grain acres in Nebraska. Um, so, and some are, are actually quite near to us. So extra fortunate, like where we get our oats from, some alfalfa to put in the chicken feed. Um, and then there's Green Place Foods in Nebraska. So that's about an hour and a half, maybe two hours away in a grain truck. Um, and uh there's popcorn and things like, and, uh, Milo that we can get all. So yes, definitely within Nebraska. Um, so we're really fortunate in that regard. Um, and so, and some of that feeds coming from maybe half hour, 45 minutes away, even if it's getting cleaned over there and then we're picking up as much of the scrappy stuff as we can just to keep costs low. So, um, that's been really, really a great resource for us. And, um, I forget that that's not always available for certified organic chicken feed or hog feed um, that because we do have it and we've made those connections. Um, We did just have to buy a grain truck just to make it a little bit easier to get them in a timely way um, so that we can keep, keep the other end of the relationship happy and get them when we need them. So um, we just bought an old grain truck, um, really old grain truck. Um, but as long as it can go there a few times a year, that's all we need. How much of your business is vegetables and how much of it is livestock in terms of your overall sales? Vegetables overall, I'd say is about at least a third or more, maybe more than that. I'm starting to get mixed up with how much is like I get, I think more in terms of how much is like CSA and how much is eggs. Those are some of the numbers I look at more. So 
I'd say our CSA is more like, which is veg, but it's also uh, the CSA is probably about a third to a fourth of our farm income. Um, and eggs is another, I'd say, in their third to a fourth. And then the rest is um, plants and then the meat, pork and beef and kind of just random veg, I guess, like their wholesale type stuff. So that's just a super approximate, but um, CSA and eggs are probably our biggest chunk of our farm income. Um, and then market sales outside of that, like farmer's market in general. It all goes together, though. I Whenever I think, what what could we do without when we don't have time or if we're tired? Um, <laughs> I think, what could we not do? But then I think just as a practical matter, not talking about income, it's hard to imagine doing veg without chickens because the the chickens eat so many grasshoppers um, and it's hard to imagine doing chickens without veg. Plus we both love doing veg. So that's really hard to ever imagine not doing veg. And we started as a CSA farm. So it's all part of this crazy puzzle. But, um, and as far as for meat sales, we sell it as portions first for our beef and pork. Um, and then kind of the remainder is sold at market or just as pieces or cuts, I guess that you'd say. So kind of the, um, we go down to eighths and sixteenths even for beef, um, just because there's so many people that are going to not have anything more than the top of their fridge. There's just a lot of people that really want good quality food, but they're not in a situation where they can have a whole chest freezer. It just doesn't work in their apartment or a, um, their situation, whatever their life is, or they're um, a couple and they're not going to get through that much. And so we want that to be available to um, try and work with that as much as possible. You mentioned that you're using the chickens to control the grasshoppers, but you're not actually putting the chickens in the field. How, how do you make that work? The chickens are a great way to control grasshoppers, but I think after a while, even they get tired of eating them. Um, but we'll put them... Um, it's really been a wonderful help. Um, we'll put them near, obviously we're not going to put them in the field. Even if we put them kind of right next to the kale, we use portable fencing. And so if he moves a house or two, ever it does all the animal stuff pretty much. Um, if he puts a house, chicken house or two next to the kale, for example, or basil, something that's really suffering, um, they're going to actually, you know, obviously eat a large portion of grasshoppers near what usually happens typically is then that makes more of the um, the grasshoppers instantly hop away from the chickens. So they're getting a huge percentage. I tell myself it's a long-term gain. And then the timing has to be hopefully right um, that after we can see that their grasshoppers are reduced in numbers adjacent to the field, um, we've got to move them back out, like move the chickens away. Because uh, then that takes, it's taken the, overall pressure off the area but the grasshoppers are still are still going to not hop out so um so then if we're walking through the kale or wherever um if i'm diligent i'll walk through like several times a day to try and get the grasshoppers you know stir them up and get them towards the chickens because they don't they know they'll stop like they'll hop up to the fence the grasshoppers and then they'll like you know cut right or cut left or whatever. They're not going to, they'll just put the brakes on. <laughs> um, so if we walk through many times a day, we can get some, but I didn't do that that much this year. Um, I think I got tired of it. So uh, yeah. So then when you move the chickens back out, then the grasshoppers start still hopping farther, farther afield. Um, but you've had the overall gain of getting a large percentage of them, you know, eaten. So um, yeah, it seems to help. I mean, we've saved some, significant losses potential that way. Um, and I've seen some remarkable changes um, just within, I can tell right now where the chickens were right by um, one edge of the kale. That's actually, it should be worse as far as yields um, because it's closer to some trees. And um, that actually looks better than kind of further in the row um, just because I think it, there's still more grasshopper pressure there. So. You know, it seems like the eggs are a really important part of your business and, and that the chickens are an important part of your operation. But one of the challenges that we had on my farm was 
with the eggs and getting was getting them ready for market at the same time that we were trying to get ready for the vegetables ready for market. Can you tell me how that workflow works on your farm? In general, I think the workflow with eggs is af well, chores are in the morning. Um, it's kind of like dairy, almost more intensive in some ways. It feels like uh, chores are, in, especially the way we do it. So chores in the morning, um, getting the eggs, ideally a couple times a day. If you have, especially if you have a round of chickens that seem to be eating eggs, um, that hasn't been the case recently. But we have had that where then we have to respond for getting eggs multiple times a day. Um, so gathering eggs, then usually they uh, sit in the house or the egg washing room. And um, that's something I do after um, the house is quiet and it's real late and um, they get washed and packed and put in the fridge. So uh, in that regard, um, it is a challenge. <laughs> it's kind of like ends up feeling like it's a sideline, like a side thing, side task that has not much significance, but it's actually can be so a lot of times that's at two in the morning or one in the morning. Um, usually I try not to start washing them and after 11 at night, but um, it happens frequently. Then we were talking about also the, um, you know, the proportion of, I guess the farm stream, the income stream from that. And it's like, when I look at that, I'm like, wait, that's crazy to make this a uh, side task in the middle of the night when it, the income stream is not insignificant to the farm. So I'm like, how I, that part does not make sense at all. Especially if you have family, I just can't quite figure that one out. Um, and I'm not, it's just not worth hiring somebody to do that. Um, once in a while, the kids will do it for me. Um, if they have great taking pity on me but <laughs> usually it's you know after everybody's um at least after the smaller younger people are asleep or that's when it gets, once in a while too if it's really hot i'll do it in the middle of the day um and I'll, actually i'll probably do it today midday just because uh that's what needs to be done that's farming how are you washing your eggs we just gather them in two gallon buckets and so i just uh, wash them in water that's at least you know warmer what is it 20 10 to 20 degrees warmer than the eggs um just a quick rinse if as needed um pretty simple just lay them out to dry and then they're packed that seems pretty straightforward uh and straightforward enough we had like somebody gave us one of those egg washing agitator basket things and it just seemed gross and a big pain and yeah so i think my hands are starting to show the um the effects of all the egg washing, but it just seems the simplest. When I hear of all these systems that everybody has and we have enough chickens, we probably should figure if we had one more house, we probably have to do something different, but I just don't even know what it would be. It just seems like the simplest, most direct way. I can wash everything after I can easy to scrub up the buckets. It's easy to, um, you know, it's easy to bleach things or wash whatever needs washing without a bunch of special equipment you know engines motors whatever we need fewer motors in our life to fix and things like nothing needs you know nothing needs to be troubleshooted or whatever this way it's just plastic buckets and hands and um it's yeah what kind of regulations do you guys have on refrigerating eggs at market or for csa sales i mean they're all refrigerated here so they're cool before they go anywhere um and so the largest portion of our eggs actually go to our food co-op. I mean, that's the l largest um, number of where some are sold. So um, they go right from, you know, being refrigerated here, delivered and put to their cooler. And then at market, um, there's, I mean, everybody needs their egg code. You know, anybody that sells eggs in Nebraska, I assume that's across the board everywhere, but I guess maybe that's just Nebraska has their own. So everybody has their egg number um, and that's on our label. And then we have like for our, on our label for since so many are sold at our food co-op, there's a PLU specific to them on our label. But um, for I just pack them in a, you know, just an igloo cooler type thing for our CSA site um, with enough cold packs to keep them cold. And I think there's a thermometer in there. Um, there probably doesn't have to be, but there's it's just in there. And then at market, same there needs it needs to be cold enough. Um that if they if the health department comes by and tests it that it's the right temperature um but 
they always lay it on the hottest spot. I always think it's interesting. Um, they don't open the egg carton because eggs are always colder than carton because the carton's taking the is protecting them anyway. And so that has to have cold enough temperature. So they're packed also in egg igloo coolers at market and then with enough ice packs um, and a thermometer in each cooler also so we can check the temp as needed. So on the farm, are you guys keeping the eggs in the same cooler as you keep the vegetables or are you, are you keeping those separate? We have separate egg fridges. Like I have uh, two, well, I have one dedicated for eggs and one that's mostly dedicated for eggs, but I can uh, just like a, a fridge only. And then I'll use it for veg if I need it. Like right now there's a couple small toads of beets in there, but no eggs. But my, I have one other just for egg only fridge. We actually have pretty minimal refrigeration on the farm, actually, for veg. It's pretty amazing for the volume we do <laughs> because we pack and go. It's like we harvest everything pretty much, and it's out of here if possible. I mean, we don't hold very much if we can help it. How many days a week are you taking product to market? Um, during the season, we have our CSA on Monday. Like I have a group of people on Monday and a group of people on Thursday. So two days a week for that. When On Wednesdays right now is our um, and other like wholesale type stuff, direct retail. And then Sunday is our market day. And are you generally harvesting in the morning and then delivering in the afternoon for that? Yes. And so, yeah, CSA, we're picking, I mean, you know, obviously things like zucchini and cucumbers where you're picking every 48 hours, um, then we're, and then those are, you know, picked. And that's what's pretty much occupying all my storage right now, cool storage. Um, where, when we get squeezed, there's things like cabbage that has to get out of the field. And that's when we start getting squeezed with some space issues. Um, but, yeah, so it's it's pick, pack, and, and leave. Basically, I'm short of minivan right now. Even you can get an amazing amount in like a, a town and country. They're awesome. You can get so much in there. And I would just blast the, like I would blast the um, air. I mean, I'd be like freezing because I'd blast air. Uh, and I actually, I have a Kia Soul and I can get, with all the seats down, I can get quite a lot in there. And it's air, can, you know, and then if I have the air on. Um, but right now, if I have a big load and it's pretty cool and stuff, you know, moist and it's, we keep it covered and moist and, and I zoom to Lincoln with it and it's fine. And we can cover it too, kind of in the, with like cool cloth, we, we'll cover it if we need to in the truck. But by and large, you know, if everything's in wax boxes and it's been fine, but um, I had a minivan get totaled, so I haven't replaced it. So that would be my preference at least. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it is, it is amazing how much stuff you can get into, into your normal average passenger vehicle. I mean, there's, there's a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of space, especially in a minivan. We hauled a lot of stuff uh, in those, I know, on my right. farm in the early years. How much storage then do you guys have on the farm? Are you using walk-in coolers? Um, we don't have one at this time. We've had a couple different series of panels <laughs> sitting here. Um, there are some that we decided we didn't want. And so somebody, um, somebody took those away and, or, you know, we got rid of those. Um, somebody that wanted to try messing around with them more than we did. And so, yeah, um, we have a two door and we have a, another kind of a, a, I don't know what it's called. It's not a deli cooler. It's a long, it's a low, long thing, and I can get, we can get like 15 medium, like, you know, whatever Rubbermaid totes in there or so. So, I mean, that's pretty, not insignificant. Um, it's not ideal, certainly not ideal for getting stuff in and out of, but no, it's, yeah, a walk-ins like a, or something is a high priority at this point. Because when, when we get into bulk cabbage, like I said, I mean, you just, there's been a couple of times we got lucky a couple of years ago. There was somewhere in Lincoln that we could rent a pallet of storage. Um, and then they went to freezer only, which it was too bad because it was an awesome solution for us to you know, just have short term storage of a large quantity of stuff. And they're actually certified organic or, you know, they hold certified organic goods, but they went to freezer only. So 
Shoot, because that is such a convenient arrangement. Yeah. I, I'd use some offsite storage one year when we had an exceptional carrot harvest. And it was it was such a value to us to to be oh, able yeah. to not have to make the investment there on the farm. Right. Because you don't yeah, if you just happen to have this like exceeding year or you know, you got backlogged or whatever, I mean you it just seems an impractical use of for planning for every eventuality on the farm, especially if you're so diversified, um, to say we need all the storage all the time when we don't. I mean, most of the time we can get by without, you know, once in a while, you know, we've had really great late broccoli. I mean, great being relative, you know, depending on, but, you know, enough broccoli that we wanted to hold it for a holiday market. But even that, I mean, when it's, you know, 40 degrees outside, you can hold a lot in igloo coolers with top ice, you know, with like big coolers. I mean, that's, that's not, you know, that's not an issue when it's cold outside at night. You're, you are a walking cooler. So it's like, <laughs> or during the day or whatever, it's more almost keeping it warm enough then. So, right. So, and we do have a root cellar. Um, it's not underground, but it's, we call it the root cellar, but it's actually, um, that is kind of, um, uh, that's where our long-term um, data storage is and um, winter squash. And we can hold also some stuff in, so it won't freeze. There's some, so um, it actually starts getting too cold in there by January um, just because the cement, like even if I put a heater in there, the cement, it's going to come up. So with, with some straw, it'll hold it longer, you know, some straw and keeping it warm off the ground. But um, so that that gives us some um, appropriate temperatures later on when we're looking for it too. So tell me about that storage space. When you talk about a, a root cellar that's not under the ground, um, what does that actually look like? Well, I should say it's partly under the ground, obviously, um, but it's not like a cave. Like I guess, like my grandma had, it's not that kind of <laughs> cave in the ground. So it's surrounded by yeah, it's like walk out kind of. Walk out on the south side is just regular, completely exposed, um, and then the rest is covered in dirt. So it's kind of it's where our, it's attached to our house on one part of one side. <clears throat> so it kind of to explain like we have a walkout door of our house, like that side's a walkout. What is that called? Walkout basementy or whatever. Right. And then that's um, the root cellar is also exposed on that same side. So there the house and the root cellar, so to speak, are connected um, on a partial wall. I mean, that's so that was the first thing that got built actually before our house was <laughs> that, that root cellar because we put our pressure, our water pressure tank in there in a corner and then that's protected off from where the vegetables are. It's not very large, but it's um, it's big enough that we can get a significant amount of like winter squash stacked in there. Right now, it's mostly got... It also has a um, couple meat cool or meat freezers in there, one for ourselves that's only my stuff, and one for farm farm meat like cuts that are held on the farm or not held, but after all our portions are sold, if we have individual cuts left, then those will go in there. So, how many CSA members do you guys have? This year we had sixty-five. Last year we had eighty. Um, so. And I think the reduction is the universe hearing me say, this is too much. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it when you talk about staying up until one or two in the morning washing eggs, I think, uh, I think that is, uh, that does sound like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most people know that know us personally know that we're usually getting only at best five hours of sleep at night in the summer, usually more like four. And that's obviously not sustainable, but somehow we've been sustaining it. But I think finally this year, this year might be the year where we're just like enough. Um, that's it's just too much. So, yeah, I think, um, but it's hard when you like what you do a lot. And <laughs> I'm sure you know how all that works, right? Well, yeah. And I, I certainly remember that, that those operating on five and six hours of sleep a night was, was one thing in my late twenties and early thirties. And it was an entirely different thing in my late thirties and early forties. Uh, and it's right. pretty much impossible for me now. It just doesn't work. So. Well, and that's what, I mean, I'm, I don't know if I'm you know, not necessarily public. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I'm 
early 50s and I'm yeah I'm starting to feel it and a friend and I were talking um at market on Sunday and you know I well I always thought in my 20s I'm like I can do this even early 30s mid 30s late 30s I thought I'll choose I'll choose when I don't do this anymore I'll choose and it's like I don't know if you get to choose you know what I mean I think maybe you don't necessarily get to choose what you have to change and when you have to change it. And I'm starting to see my full-time farming friends. I'm seeing their health start to, you know, as they've gotten into their mid to late fifties and we've been working so hard. I am starting to see some, that none of us are, and, and they're not getting to choose. I mean, like some serious health concerns that, um, yeah, I mean, partly that's just life, but it's also people have been really hard on our bo- their bodies, and we've been hard on our bodies, but you don't think about it. And but I did get some good stories early on. I mean, some people that warned us that said, you know, don't ride a clutch because they've had, a, you know, they had a hip replaced because they were the clutch instead of, you know, getting a creeper here. I mean, so we had some pretty good warnings, and we try, we tried to pay attention, but um, sleep is huge. You need it, and that's yeah, <laughs> says me right now. <laughs> so do you so. guys see changes in your farm ahead? And, and what sort of changes do you see as uh, to adapt to the simple fact of biology and getting older? Right. Um, that, I don't know. I feel like that's a pressing question, but it, it, uh, hopefully in an exciting way. I mean, I do feel like I, I, don't feel like, oh, this is gloom and doom. I feel like, wow, there's like, it's a challenge or it could be a challenge. Like, how can we respond? Um, for me, the plant sale is one thing that I've, even if several years ago, I guess we've had it actually, maybe not a decade. We've had quite a number of years. I'm losing track of time for sure. But and I do think things like that where I'm like, even though it's taxing, it's like, it's not stooping or it's not stooping all the time. You know what I mean? Or it's, I'm, I'm, I'm making those plans, but then they leave. Um, so I think, I don't know. I think I've tried to think of that ahead of time. Some, um, I don't know if there's some magic answer or if it'll just evolve over time of, you know, because when we look at the farm as a whole thing, how do you pull out a piece? You know, I don't think it's going to be that simple necessarily to say, well, we're not doing this piece now, and but maybe it is. I don't know. I'm not sure what the answer to that is. I'm trying to be, a little more, um, I guess, less of, oh, we've always done it this way, you know, or even our CSA, you know, well, we've done it this way, or we've had this many shares, or we, you know, we've had 80, is it okay to do 65, or is it going to be okay to have do it one day a week instead of two days a week, you know, things like that. How much, how many shares could we do on one day and still, you know, it's enough, for example, instead of two days, if that gives us another day of, you know, not harvesting or not, but I don't know. So those are lots of questions, but I hope they're fun questions. Like I hope they're questions that are uh, hopeful to answer instead of, you know, I don't want it to be a, wow, I'm getting old kind of thing. I don't want it. I don't want that because I don't think that sounds very fun. So. (laughs) Yeah. And it's, it's always hard to know what pieces of the, of that Jenga tower to, to pull out you know, and, and know right. what the effects are really going to be uh, down the road. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you don't, and I mean, you're continually probably problem solving. I mean, that's what, every, you know, anyone that's been farming very long or in lots of, you know, in lots of livelihoods have been doing it, if they're doing it and they're still doing it. But um, I mean, that's continually what you're doing. I think that's partly why farmers are so tired at the end of the day. It's not just a physical, it's like this constant 24 hours a day, troubleshooting, problem solving, you know, something broke, something didn't work. What do you have to do? All that. But I mean, I think a good example of just responding is like when we lost some of our pasture ground that we've been working with for a decade. So we're like, okay, well, we're going to reduce the herd size because you can't just pick up, you know, certified organic grazing ground nearby at the drop of a hat, even though we've kind of been looking, um, it just hasn't been coming together. And in lieu of buying ground immediately, and we can't, it continuously, which would be nice. Um, anyway, so we got another sow. So, I mean, it's, you know, we'll do more hogs and less beef, I guess, in response to that. So, I mean, there's, you know, if you're trying to always see well, where are things at and what can you keep doing and and what's the response, you know, from the community, things like that. So, um, I guess that's the part that keeps it interesting, partly. 
So you mentioned, you know, losing that pasture ground. Do you guys rent or own most of your ground? Uh, we own the home place that we have is 20 acres. And that includes, I mean, that's obviously got our house and everything on it. Um, and the fun thing about, I guess, Histor- in the history, um, originally we had just an acre of ground that we were borrowing, so to speak, from kind of friends of friends that are now our friends, of course. Um, and then when we bought this piece, um, we were looking for a little bit more than 20 just because of um, building codes and stuff in Lancaster County, Nebraska. Um, not that building codes are bad, but um, they're pretty strict and um, kind of in our opinion, make it difficult if you even want to put up like a woodshed, for example, or a high tunnel. But when we bought this ground, uh, we had a CSA member that had been with us out of the gate and um, he had some money available to him um, that he was looking to invest and decided that we were the best investment. When we got the land, our friend loaned us some money, but it's something called NIFA, Nebraska Investment Finance Authority. I think it's what it stands for. And generally it's used in um, cities, especially if it's kind of a a distressed area of a town or whatever. Um, But uh, um, there's also, at that time, I'm not sure if it still exists, was an ag an ag loan option and the benefit to the person, the lender, um, it could be a bank, but in our situation, it was a direct loan um, that was serviced by a bank just so we didn't have to pay him directly. We were, he, we went through his bank and, you know, would make typical loan payments there and they would record it. Anyway, so this knife alone, um, the gain for him was um, he, like, for example, if we at the time, I don't know, I think we were paying say if we were paying 6%, the tax benefit to him was it's like he was realizing 8 or 9% because he had a tax, um, mm-hmm. like the he didn't have to show the income the same way. Yeah. So basically the, the interest that you were playing plus the tax benefit that he got actually turned out to make this a good investment without you guys having to pay the full amount of the benefit that he was receiving. Right. Yeah. Right. And so we are actually, and the benefit for us, because ag loans, well, they had just come off about 12%. I think they were still nine, which I know in the age of so recently of everything being like two, um, but ag loans are always more because they're not, they know people aren't going to have the typical, you know, every, the turnover that there is continuously in the housing market. So that they're continually realizing the repetitiveness of getting all those mortgage fees and all the interest over and over or, you know, like redoing all this stuff, but that doesn't happen in ag loans. And that's why ag loans are always more. So anyway, so yeah, we got to pay much less than the going, I mean, at the time, like three or 4% less than what the going ag rate was at that time. So that helped us also. And also we didn't look great on paper. I mean, we didn't look great on paper as a typical, you know, all the numbers that they run and and they think you still are going to, you know, it adds up to not working and it did work because we made it work. So, um, yeah, it was close, but but it worked. (laughs) Anyway, so that was, yeah, that was a huge piece of, um, that, you know, he had whatever available at that time and that NIFA was there um, as a resource to encourage him, I guess. I think that made it a sweeter a sweeter deal for him that kind of helped seal the deal. I think he was interested, but I think that really made it. I mean, he still needed it to be attractive to him. Um, And it was then. So there was, um, and it gave him an immediate investment at the time when he was looking for something. We refinanced later, actually, when loans went down in um, percentages because we'd had a history then. um, And we could get from the bank after several, quite a few years. we could get a better rate than what we had had at that time with him. Um, And there were some terms in there that bothered me. It was just a pretty standard contract thing, but it was, I think if one of us was deceased, the the loan was, had to be paid in full within 30 days. And that bothered me that that was in there and it wasn't negotiable. So I just didn't, I didn't, I was glad to get away from that. It didn't matter obviously in the end, but it was still, to have that kind of stuff hanging over you isn't very nice. So with that, 
I think it's time for us to turn to our lightning round. So we're going to take a quick break, get a word from one more sponsor, and then, and then we'll be right back. This lightning round, as well as perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast, is brought to you by Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. Vermont Compost potting soils are a really special product. You know, you try to come up with adjectives for this, but I mean, I'm, I'm kind of stuck with that. They're a really special product. I used Vermont Compost Fort V as a blocking mix and as potting soil for over 12 years on my farm, and we grew some really great transplants with it. I mean, really, really great transplants consistently year after year. At a time in the organic movement, we're seeing more and more companies jumping on the bandwagon. Vermont Compost is a reminder of the art and the craft of making potting soil. They mix an incredible diversity of ingredients into the compost that forms the basis of their potting soil, incorporating many kinds of manures along with plant materials and food waste to foster structure and aeration in the compost. I love that their Fort V mix even has chips of ocean blue granite in it and some kelp that gives it just a little bit of a smell of the ocean, as well as, of course, does some really great things for the plants. One thing I've always appreciated about Vermont Compost is their ability to put a consistent product year after year. And it's something that's subject to as many variables as market farming. It's nice to have something you can count on. VermontCompost.com. Ruth, what's your favorite tool on the farm? I have one particular hoe that I love. And if I'm out in the field, it's mine. So um, that and then bigger tool, rototiller. I love our tractor mounted rototiller. Um, and I also my favorite, our favorite field knife is, I think it's from Johnny's. It's from Johnny's. But it's brown, basic. Stainless steel, don't use anything else anymore. That's like our go-to. Um, works for pretty much everything except spinach. Yeah. We haven't talked a whole lot about Everett. Everett was supposed to join us today and we we had some issues and, and he wasn't able to be with us. But so Everett, your husband and your, and your farming partner, what's Everett's farming superpower? The guy doesn't quit. He's linear where I'm circuitous. He, um, he's got pretty good stamina. He, I, he's got lots of superpowers in that regard. Um, he will just continue to problem solve like, and learn stuff. I mean, he just keeps learning. Like if he doesn't, he didn't know how to weld that much, like just a little when we started and he just kept at it and knows how to weld. If he, he'll just, he'll, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's a superpower, but it's pretty, it's pretty good. It sounds like a superpower to me. What's your favorite crop to grow? Um, I really like head lettuces, I guess. Yeah, I really like head lettuces. Um, there's lots of other fun ones. I mean, but they're just, they're beautiful. They're fun to sell. They're gorgeous to put in a CSA box with different colors. It's like a wedding bouquet over and over when they're working. When they're not, <laughs> then it's, yeah. Um, there's a lot of them I like to grow, but they're I, head lettuces. I like bunch and kale. Um, that's an, I do like that. Um, and I can't say Everett, he loves the alliums or his, Everett loves the alliums. He loves onions. He loves garlic. He loves growing them. With the head lettuce, do you guys do season extension into the summer with the head lettuce? Or is that something where you're kind of farming that traditional Midwest narrow spring window for that crop? Well, I usually do it spring and I'll try and catch it in the fall. Um, we tried to do a little bit. Sometimes we can push it a little bit in the summer. Um, there's certain varieties that can can take the heat a little bit. Um, we keep talking about making a portable shake off and just haven't gotten it done. I'd like to, just if it was one bed's worth. Um, then also, whenever we do those kind of, you know, if you think of doing that, it's like there's we're busy for a reason. There's all these other things to do. There's other things we're picking and growing. And so do we really need head lettuce right then? But um, so maybe, I mean, we might, we don't right now much, but, but we definitely put in a smaller fall round or two just to have it. Um, and it's nice to have people are ready for some other variety of greens by then. And finally, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Uh, make sure you get some sleep. <laughs> 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 um, I don't know. I don't, I, maybe I haven't learned. Um, I never have a good answer for that. Uh, eat, eat your own food. Eat good food. Yeah, definitely get some sleep. Don't get too hooked on coffee. Take care of yourself because, you, yeah, you really have to take care of yourself. Awesome. Ruth, thank you so much for being part of the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. 
Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 135 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. You can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Chantry. That's C-H-A-N-T-R-Y. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk behind farming equipment and high quality garden tools in North America. And by Rock Dust Local, the first company in North America specializing in local sourcing and delivery of the best rock dust and biochar for organic farming. And by Local Food Marketplace, providing an integrated, scalable solution for farmers and food hubs to process customer orders, including online ordering, harvesting, packing, delivering, invoicing, and payment processing. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your inbox every Thursday morning by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, if you like the show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review or talk to us in the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. You can support the show directly by going to farmer to farmer slash donate. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world and you can help. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmer to farmer podcast.com and I will do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.